Uh, good morning and welcome to the 23rd meeting in 2018 of the Financial and Constitution Committee. Uh, the first item on our agenda today is to warmly welcome Tom Arthur to the committee and invite Tom to declare any relevant interests. Thank you, convener, and good morning. It's a pleasure to be joining this committee. I can confirm that I have no relevant interests to declare, and I would like us to take this opportunity to place my apologies, as I will have to leave at 11.40 to attend another committee. Thank you very much, Tom. Very grateful to you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is to decide whether to take item 5 in private today and consideration of a draft report on the UK Trade Bill LCM in private at a future meeting. Are members agreed? Yes. Members are agreed. Our next piece of business is to report back from the committee's fact-finding visit to Brussels last week, where we explored how common frameworks will operate in other countries and how these relate with trade negotiations in particular. Um, we'll shortly publish a note from the clerks summarising our discussions, um, whether that was with the NGOs, the organisations we met, um, or the representatives of Germany, Switzerland, Norway and Canada. Uh, and we've also commissioned some um, research in these areas, which will also be published. Uh, but for the moment, I'd just like to give my own quick feedback on the, the, the visit to Brussels. I thought it was very successful. I, I think it was highly educational, certainly for me. Uh, and I'll ask other members to reflect on um, their own findings as far as that's concerned. Um, well, first of all, I think, as I said, thank you for those who... who commented yesterday in the chamber as part of the, the government's debate on future trade negotiations on some of the reflections already. Uh, and I, I don't want to repeat some of that, but I suppose it, some of it will be necessary. I think the key thing that came from through for me in terms of a common theme across all of the countries um, was the, the whole issue of the early engagement process they're involved in. But it's not only early and deep engagement with their between the state and the sub-state, it's also the involvement of their parliaments, stakeholders, NGOs, etc., and the way they went about their business, I thought, I thought in, internally in their own countries was something we could learn from. And it wasn't just engagement at the beginning, it was a continual engagement on the process on the way through, helping to, to build a level of trust and understanding of the, the various positions taken from the sub-states. At the end of the day, I think that prov provided a, a framework that ensured that the there was more co-ownership of the final position taken by the state, more collective understanding of why they'd reached that position and therefore um, and, and got to agreement and therefore probably strengthened their own position in negotiations because they knew everybody behind them and the rest of their country was well uh, in tune with what the front position of the, the nation state was in these circumstances. It was also clear that clear formal structures were very helpful and making sure that that process of discussion did uh, actually happen. Uh, and uh, Obviously, there would be lots of other quieter, non-formal discussions ongoing as well, but there was a formal process, I think, which helped, and everyone understood clearly the remit and role of the, the various bodies. Um, I, from my own, some of my own reflection from that, I think we've tended, in, certainly in Scotland, because of where we've come from, our default position has been how can we improve the dispute mechanisms rather than being about how can we ensure that we can come to consensus and agreement and front-loading the process to get to that end. And I thought that was quite a useful learning uh, position for me. Certainly clear to me that that in-depth process from the beginning meant that there was less use of dispute mechanisms, less use of costly court proceedings um, because that, that general agreement had been reached in some, indeed I think Willie reflected yesterday in the chamber that the Swiss were quite surprised when we talked about disputes um, because of the way and nature that they involved their cantons in the discussion. Um, so I think that was very useful. Um, so what do we need to learn from that? Well, I think it's pretty obvious the need for that meaningful engagement of devolved institutions, civic society, NGOs and other organisations and the development of the common frameworks and how we go about it as part of our job as a committee. Uh, and it's obviously got some relationship, not just common, because common frameworks are related to how trade arrangements will work in the future. That early and ongoing discussion process to find agreement, um, better agreements led to less disputes 
it was quite an important lesson for us, well understood structures, but I think the biggest and most important one, how we build that trust and confidence for the future, certainly the things I learned from that visit. Was there. Others like to reflect? Angela. I, I, I think, like you, I was very struck by the um, early and ongoing <coughs> investment in you know, uh, negotiation uh, and discussions, how that actually led to um, outcomes that were better for the, uh, uh, you know, the, the nation state uh, as a whole, if you want to uh, put it that way. I was also struck that um, you know, each country um, each case study that, that we looked at, while they all had different histories, different structures, different cultures, um, and you know we can't necessarily do some sort of easy shift and lift. We can uh, cherry pick, um, but there are opportunities to um, you know look at these experiences further and, and adapt them uh, to to um, our, our own. Um, but it did. Um, you know, it, it, it did give some cause for hope that you know, if other countries um, are able um, to um, get better at that, you know, local, uh, regional, and national um, dialogue and to seek um, agreement early, that you know, surely, you know, we can find uh, new ways um, to, to, to work together with our various uh, partners, uh, particularly in relation to trade. Well, no. Come here, I think um, you've given a very a fair summary of uh, what we heard. Um, one thing that struck me was it was difficult to find any direct parallels to the sort of common frameworks we're talking about in, in the UK. Um, that's not to say there wasn't a lot we could learn from um, the people we met, but uh, other countries don't have that exact arrangement that we're likely to enter. I think um, the point Angela's just made about, um, and you made yourself, about uh, uh, upfront uh, discussions uh, being more important than complex dispute resolution, I think is a very fair one. The other issue um, that came up with the discussions we had with the uh, EFTA um, surveillance agency is whether there is a need for a watchdog uh, over the common frameworks. Um, to, to ensure, in particular, that the rights of, of, of citizens and entities like businesses are actually properly safeguarded, and maybe that's something we need to consider further. Yeah. Okay. Patrick? Um, given that uh, I was only able to take part in day one of the, the visit, I'll be interested in, in speaking more to, to colleagues about uh, what, you, what you gathered on, on day two, but um, I mean, I think in relation to the, the point that Marto Fraser raises, the, the need for uh, some degree of, of monitoring and accountability arrangements, this is one of the things that may test the asymmetric nature of devolved or decentralised power in, within the UK, you know, to what level of government or to, to which levels of government uh, would such structures be accountable or, or to, to which would they report. I think also the, the very clear description you gave of the open participative uh, communicative process uh, that works well elsewhere. I think the most stark thing is is quite how far we seem to be from that. If that's what we're looking to get to, we're not starting as we mean to go on. And what we have at the moment is a, a pretty behind closed doors discussion between two governments, which is not taking place in that open participative spirit. Uh, and I think perhaps both governments need to be challenged more strongly on that in the in the in the in the immediate time before we start implementing common frameworks. James? Sorry, James and then Willie. Yeah, I suppose to reflecting on some of that, the, the number one over there was to to tackle these issues of, you know, dispute, dispute resolution and to explore how we can we can get some uh, agreement and consensus, you know, because clearly the the issues just now around the common frameworks uh, are difficult and challenging. Um, I suppose, as others have said, you know, across a range of examples, you know, Germany, Switzerland, Canada, we saw that, you know, well, there were clear rules and mechanisms in place, and there were ongoing discussions. Then they were able to, uh, in many cases, get that agreement without, you know, going uh, going to court. Uh, and I suppose that's. That's a challenge. I think you know Patrick's right. We're not at we're not at, at that kind of stage just now. But what the visit has shown is, is that, as Angela said, um, there are ways of doing it. 
uh, there is a way forward. Uh, and I think the challenge is to try and move on to one of these models. But it, it needs a it needs a change in culture essentially, you know, from all the parties involved. I think, you know, we've just by the nature of politics, I suppose we've been we've all been too confrontational about it. Um and it was interesting hearing some of the participants in the sessions and you know, they, they very much came, even when they disagreed, they very much came from a, an approach of we've got to get an agreement at the end of the day. Willie, and then Neil. Yeah. Thanks, Bruce. I mean, uh, uh, everything colleagues are saying I really I agree with, and I, I was genuinely surprised at uh, how cooperative our colleagues in the European countries, particularly the German and, and Swiss, were about these kind of matters. But they've put an awful lot of effort haven't they, into the kind of upfront in advance engagement and so on and so forth, whether at government level or even civic society level. And for us, if we're taking this forward, I, I hope that somehow we can reach out uh, on behalf perhaps of Wales and Northern Ireland to, to the UK government to say, look, would you uh, agree to engage with us on these kinds of issues to see if we can make genuine improvements and progress in this area? Because I think we'll all, we'll all genuinely win at the end of that process. You know. I, would, I, I would agree with your summary, convener. Um, I made, made a contribution in the debate yeah. yesterday, um, which which touched on a, lot, you know, a number of those issues. I would agree particularly with Patrick Harvey's point about transparency of intergovernmental relations. I uh, repeat that. And, and, and James's point about, yeah, we you know, need formal structures, new ways of working, but that needs to be underpinned by a, a spirit of cooperation and goodwill from all involved, and um, I think that would go a very long way to resolving a lot of the issues that we face. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Convener. Um, I echo everybody's comments, and I just I'd like to thank the committee clerks for their diligence in organising the, the the meetings, events, the whole trip. It was uh, it was uh, seamless, and I note that you know the the meetings, the organisations, the NGOs that were there. The, it was apparent to me that everybody had a, a continual professional engagement and a willingness to listen and try and support, I guess, the, the ask that we had with common frameworks when that's language that they aren't often using. There was one particular point that when we met the Director General of the Agricultural Division, when she mentioned that the revision or the evolution of the common agricultural policy, which we will be exiting, was to focus on a more nationalistic or a independent country approach because the recognition was that each uh, country might have a different need when it comes to applying certain principles of the uh, like cap or the agricultural approach that i found was quite interesting when we visited uh, the eu commission for agriculture okay thank you colleagues for that feedback um, and as i say the, the notes being provided by the clerks will eventually will become a public document listen we're a wee bit ahead of schedule I know that all, not all witnesses are here at this stage. Would the committee agree with me that in that case we should just take this item five now in private and then we can get that business discharged and we'll come back to the round table discussion? Agreed. Okay, we're agreed to take item five in private now. Thank you.
Uh, hello again, colleagues. Our next piece of business today is to take evidence in a roundtable format. Um, this is the first year of the new budget process, um, which emphasises the year-round approach we're now taking to budgeting as far as the Scottish Parliament and its committees are concerned. Um, and today's roundtable to kick this process off will be the first of five, will be sorry, the second of five evidence-taking sessions we will hold on the draft budget for 2019-20. But today we'll be taking evidence and that discussion from a number of people. But first of all, let me say uh, Peter Rickey, who's the Director of Investment for Scottish Futures Trust, gives his apologies. He's another event, other things have come up in his diary he's had to attend. It's a shame Peter can't be here. I've, I've enjoyed his contributions that other events have been at. But however, we've still got some good folk around about us. We've got Carolyn Gardner, who's Auditor General for Scotland, Helen Martin, the Assistant General Secretary of the STUC, Mary Tunby, the Assistant Director of Policy CBI Scotland, Jim Cuthbert, an independent researcher, Jenny Stewart, partner of the Head of Infrastructure and Cuthbert at KPMG, and Elaine Lorimer, last but not least, the Chief Executive of Revenue Scotland. I warmly welcome all of our witnesses to the table this morning and this round table discussion. Um, no, please feel free to contribute at any stage because it's genuinely a free-flowing discussion. Um, um, members have had a couple of briefing papers from some of the members around the table and some excellent material provided by our SPICE colleagues and our advisor David Esler already uh, to, to help us understand the context of why we're having that discussion today. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask a different member, member of the Scottish Parliament to lead off a discussions in three separate areas, uh, operation of the fiscal framework, relative economic growth and structure of the Scottish economy and demographic change. Uh, and then after that, MSPs and you know, other contributors, please feel free to chip in. But to kick that process off this morning on the operation of the fiscal framework, Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, convener, and good morning to everybody. Um, one of the principles that was agreed in the fiscal framework was to review its effectiveness around about 2021. Um, do you think that uh, in that review, and bearing in mind the kind of variances we've seen in forecasting from both the OBR and the SFC, that we need to look a wee bit closer in that review of the impact of forecast error that it could have in the Scottish budget? And what kind of ideas could you suggest or offer that might assist that process to smooth out the potential impact that risk might have in the overall budget? It's a good starter for 10 because we've obviously, David um, Eisner on page 9 of his report, uh, the, which you've read and everyone's got a copy of, described quite well, I think, some of these challenges around the, the different mechanisms, processes, approaches used by the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the OBR and the potential for variant um, forecasts from that and, the, and obviously the potential impact that that has on the Scottish budget without gov either government making any change to policy. I'd like to kick that off, that discussion. Jim. Jim. I, I, I gave a paper which has been circulated, um, thank you for that, uh, which is very much on this topic, so I, I, you know, I, think, I think I'd like to say something. And I think the point I was making in my paper was that the way the fiscal framework has been set up, and clearly it was set up under political constraints and under considerable time constraint, in a sense maximises the forecast error around this important thing of the effect of the fiscal, the fiscal settlement. And I think that should really be looked at at two levels. One level is that within the existing fiscal framework, I think there's a number of things that should be done. There should be a mechanism which throws up potential anomalies. And I took one particular set of figures, which will now be out outdated, and showed how within that set of figures there's quite a strong potential anomaly, which is that the SSC is forecasting per capita NSND receipts in Scotland to grow at a faster rate than um, um, uh, than the corresponding receipts in forecast by OBR and the rest of the UK, even though the, the forecast of GDP, per capita GDP in Scotland, is growing at a slower rate, and also uh, average earnings is growing at a slower rate in Scotland than the rest of the UK. So there's a strong potential anomaly, uh, anomaly there, which isn't explained just by the, ta the, 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 the Scottish Government's policy changes on tax. And I don't know whether that anomaly is um, 
uh, indicates something worrisome or not. But the important point is it needs to be understood before the Scottish Government can take a view as to whether the potential benefit it's getting a £500 million per annum from the operation of the fiscal settlement tax changes is likely to be real or not. So there needs to be, to my mind, a mechanism which identifies anomalies like that and then digs into the figures and says this is occurring because of the following factors and maybe even takes a view which says this looks reasonable or not, as the case may be. So that's one thing that needs to be done. I don't know what that mechanism would, would be. I don't know whether it's up to the SFC and the OBR to get together and do that sort of work. I don't know if it's up to the Scottish Government or I don't know if it's up to academics like the Fraser Valley to do it. But there should be somebody, in my view, who's detailed to do that kind of, kind of work. Secondly, we're dealing with an entity, the effective fiscal settlement, which is the difference of two large forecast numbers. What one needs to do in that circumstance is to maximise the correlation between the different forecasts. Uh, it was interesting that when the committee asked SFC precisely the right question as to why a similar anomaly is occurring in previous figures, SFC came back with, to my mind, completely the wrong answer. They said, well, part of it is due to tax changes, but r the rest of it is due to differences in economic factors and modelling, etc. It's precisely those things that we should be worried about and seeking to remove from the system by maximising the common ground between OBR and SFC. So OBR and SFC should be working together to see to what extent they can take common ground of factors like that and identifying the areas they can't take common ground on and why. So that again, uh, and that, you know, that would contribute again to the, the understanding of anomalies. So I think you need a mechanism which does these two, these two things. Um, you also need a mechanism which removes commonality. Now that's, um, it, 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 what I mean by that is a bit complicated, but it may be that the change in forecast NSND receipts in Scotland by the SFC depends, let's say, upon their assumption about UK GDP. It may be that the OBR's assumption, which leads to the, 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 B, the BGA forecast, the change in BGA, depends upon forecast UK GDP. But it may be that the difference between the two does not depend on... Um, is, not, is not sensitive to UK GDP, in which case you sh they should be using the same assumption of UK GDP in making their, their forecast. Um, and you remove from the forecast error the difference between the o OBR and SFC assumption on UK GDP. I, know I was only giving that as a potential example, but commonalities like that need to be identified by someone in the modelling process and steps taken to take them out. So you think you need the mechanism which is able to do all these three things. But in the longer term, I think when we come to a review of the um, fiscal settlement, we need to think very hard of issues like this. Now, in the run-up to the um, uh, determination of the current fiscal settlement, insofar as I had an input which was limited, I was arguing that the system we were setting up did not make sense, and was arguing for a different one, where in fact the block grant adjustment was in increased by a constant percentage each year, subject to some review. And I think that a mechanism like that could well reduce possible forecast error. It might not, it all depends on the correlation, but again, that might need to be looked at. But we need to be taking in this sort of effect, I think, when we're redesigning the um, whole fiscal settlement in the, the forthcoming review. Thank you. Caroline? Thank you, convener. Um, I think in response to your question, um, Willie Coffey, that I'd say both, on the one hand, it's kind of too soon to say that we know what's happening with the devolved taxes, but they're very small in the overall impact on the Scottish Government's budget. Um, we've only now got control over income tax, and we won't start making adjustments until 2020-21. We won't know the outturn until um, 12 months from now. Um, and at the same time, I think we're all getting a much better sense of how complex this really is. Um, I agree with lots of the things Jim's saying about the, not just the importance of the forecast, but our understanding of the interaction between them and what happens if they're diverging versus moving in the same direction. That has very different effects on the smoothness of our budget over time. Um, but we're also um, getting a stronger sense about where the risk lies in terms of economic performance, of policy risk, um, and of the budget management risks that government needs to do. Um, and I think within Audit Scotland, for us, the really important thing is how complex that is, how complex the interactions are. 
and getting a feel for how much the variations that might come out of the other end of that actually can be managed within the provisions of the um, fiscal framework. Um, we've had a look at what the implications would be if the latest outturn forecasts for income tax are correct from both the F Fiscal Commission and the OBR. It looks as though the fiscal framework provisions would be enough for that, but if that difference continues over two or three or four years, you start to run up against the limits of the fiscal framework very quickly. Um, and we know there are long-term commitments in the budget for the first time around things like capital borrowing um, that needs to be played into that. And there's nowhere a clear picture of what that looks like in financial reporting terms that would let this committee and the parliament more widely understand it. Um, so I think, I think the forecasting approach is important, but I think um, my, my view is that we're really just getting a sense of how important all of these elements are and how they interact with each other. Just what I've got, Jenny, I just ask you to build on that then, Carlene. In terms of the, obviously, the risk area here in terms of drawdown from this, this or using the reserve money, um, if, if we can't get some correlation between, or closer correlation between the OBR and the Scottish Fiscal Commission, what do you think needs to happen to the mechanism that uh, enables that, more, that turbulent process? to be dealt with in either cash reserves or borrowing? Within, within the fiscal framework as it currently stands, um, as you say, we've got the Scotland Reserve, um, we've got the revenue borrowing powers, um, which are quite limited, um, even in the event of a Scotland-specific shock, they're only, I think, £600 million pounds a year. Um, and you've then got the um, option, perhaps the requirement of reducing spending, um, which isn't palatable to, to be done in that sort of emergency way as opposed to a planned um, redistribution of what you're spending and investing on. Um, at the moment, as I say, I think it's genuinely too soon to um, get a sense of how quickly we might come up against the limits of that because we don't know what the outcome will be on the biggest tax that's been devolved so far on income tax, won't until um, this time next year. We're not close to having devolved the which will be the second biggest element. Um, but it does feel as though um, you can do some scenarios which show you're coming up against that relatively quickly over three or four years, no further than that ahead. Um, so I think as one of the elements of the fiscal framework that it's worth marking to review, as well as the forecast approach, there is whether those um, limits and flexibilities within the fiscal framework are sufficient for the taxes that have been devolved and the likely variation in them. Jenny? You, <coughs> so... so Obviously, forecast error, we all know that the forecast will be wrong. That's, we all recognise that it's never going to be exactly the same number. So it's really about the span of that difference. The medium-term financial strategy, which it's great that we've now got one, gives some sort of um, sense of the scale of how that might impact overall. Um, but I think one of the things I wanted to stress was that the medium-term financial strategy assumes that the fiscal framework will stay will, will be pretty much the same post 2021 so that does suggest if you're looking at the numbers for 22 23 then that's quite a that's potentially quite a big assumption which obviously you're exploring in your evidence um, I think one of the points I wanted to pick up in terms of the sensitivities in an area you'd want to look at is, is you, you've had evidence from the Scottish Fiscal Commission but their latest outturn report in September showed quite clearly the differences that, forca that forecasting different groups of taxpayers make. So the fact that there was a £500 million difference because there were 2,000 fewer top rate taxpayers and additional taxpayers and um, some additional, it's far fewer 45p tax Payers. So that shows the real sensitivity around not just the overall forecasts, but how the forecasts are divided, particularly on income, across the different bands. And by moving <coughs> to more, a more banded structure, then as you move forward to 2021 and the new bands come in, then forecast error in inverted commas, or the difference of forecasts for bands will also need to be looked at quite carefully. As Caroline says, it's early days, it's um, in terms of numbers, but that would be an area that I would think you would want to, you would want to look at because the numbers are, are quite stark. Um, the other obviously key variable is, is the overall growth in, in the economy, and there's a much wider debate on that, which I think will come up in your second topic. We're going to into that. Angela? 
I just uh, want to pick up on uh, Jenny Stewart's point, uh, where she was uh, talking about new tax bans, different proportionate citizens and different uh, tax bans, and you know that in the contact context of whether or not there's uh, you know, flexibility in the fiscal framework. I'm aware that the, the, the Welsh um, experience uh, is different, uh, that there are uh, block grant adjustments calculated in accordance uh, with each uh, band of income tax. I just wondered uh, you know, what, what would be the, the pros and cons um, of that approach and whether or not that would work in a Scottish context. So um, my immediate reaction to that is if, you, if by looking at the Welsh system, you then open up the whole debate, I think, of um, the Barnett formula, actually. So, you know, from a Welsh perspective, they obviously have long argued that uh, there should be a needs-based uh, system rather than the Barnett formula. So I think by starting, you, you start to, to open up um, that debate. Um, in terms of the different tax bandings, I think the the critical point will be around getting the data from HMRC and really, as we build up more knowledge over time, really understanding the drivers for where people are sitting in different tax bands, because it will it will make quite a difference overall. You can see from the numbers how sensitive that is, and by adding in the different um, the different tax bands, you'll get a sense of that going forward. And can, sorry, just briefly, can you outline what the, um, in your view, the drivers are in terms of where, you know, what, where, where people sit in the tax bands? Uh, so that's obviously a wider, uh, that's, ob <laughs> that's obviously a wider debate around around the economy. So, um, so clearly, you've got um, what's happening overall on on wages overall. So in the at the bottom, uh, you know, how many then are sitting outside the tax system because the bands don't kick in until quite late, what's happening on overall wages versus inflation, uh, the drivers around, um, it, again, we're probably coming on to the second area around productivity, because if we can improve productivity, then that should drive up wages, which then should drive up the number of people in the higher uh, the higher tax bands. So the, the drivers are much more the, the overall, economic, overall economic drivers. Before I come to you, Jim, can I ask Elaine, on the, on, the, on the basis of some of the information that HMRC may, may have, <coughs> are there any lessons we can yet learn from the outturn figures for the fully devolved taxes for 17-18 in relation to the forecasts, particularly with regard to the robustness of the data? Are there any lessons in there for us yet that you could draw out for us? Um, Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for asking me that, because obviously um, Revenue Scotland's role in this debate is about the data and the quality of the data, because SFC and OBR are both dependent on the data that we provide for our wholly devolved taxes. What I would say um, from our perspective, um, the wholly devolved taxes are, of course, as Carling has said, small taxes in the wider scheme of things. They're wholly devolved to, to Scotland, therefore the way in which they've been set up, the way in which our systems and processes have been set up are all set up around um, timeliness of data, transparency of data. And when we set up our, um, our processes internally within Revenue Scotland, we're thinking all the time about what's the data requirement that government and SFC are going to have um, as we receive tax returns and manage tax returns. So for us, in terms of timeliness, um, you might say it's easier for us uh, to produce more timely data because our taxes are small and because our systems and processes have been set up deliberately to produce information in a timely way. Um, we also have uh, a lot of our systems are automated. Um, we've got lots of quality checks through our data and we're able to publish our LBT data on a monthly basis, our SLFT data on a quarterly basis. So the SFC and OBR are both getting information and government are getting information which is robust and timely. Now, whether that can be extrapolated out to the information that HMRC then provide, I think that's a question for them rather than me. I mean, what I would say is the taxes that they are, of course, managing are more complex. Um, the returns 
Uh, there's a lag in terms of income tax, as Caroline's pointed out, in terms of the data coming through, and that's because of the way in which income tax operates and the timeliness of returns for people in relation to their income tax. So you're not necessarily comparing like with like, but there is definitely something about when taxes are being created, thinking very thoughtfully about what's the information that's going to be needed here to enable accurate forecasting and also um, monitoring the performance of the tax because also what the stats provide is a over time really good trend analysis, really good insight into how the tax is actually performing. I just wonder while you're on that lag issue uh, between the income tax forecasts and the reconciliation, um, and recognising the scale of the challenge of getting the information out any quicker, do you think there is any scope in there at all for that lag time to be reduced? Because if we're waiting that if we're waiting that length of time, then we could end up with a big surprise. Yes, and both ways. Again, I think that really is a question for HMRC. I don't know enough about about their systems and their processes, or indeed the tax itself. Jim and then James. Yes, and Constitution uh, Committee protocol here. But on the question of Wales, I really would like to hear from David Iser because he will know more than anyone here about that. David, what are your thoughts uh, about the the Welsh adjustment yeah, there's process? No, there's no David can chip in. There's no, right. It's an It's a, a free flowing discussion, David. On you go. You're on the spot. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> um, Interestingly, I, I'm actually going to, to, to Cardiff tomorrow to talk to the Welsh Finance Committee about the, the learning from the Scottish experience and, and, and the implications for um, uh, scrutiny of uh, uh, income tax uh, revenues, which of course will become operational in Wales uh, next year, 2019-20. But again, I think it's, it goes back to the, the point that it's really too early to say um, how important it will be for Wales and how important it might be for Scotland to have a block grant adjustment for each of the uh, different bands of income tax. Uh, it really, whether that becomes an important factor in influencing the, the, the size of the Scottish budget will really depend on where the growth in income tax revenues in, in, in future years comes and, and, and how tax policy at, at UK level and at Scottish level changes. It's, it's not a given that this will disadvantage uh, Scotland by having one block grant adjustment for the whole of income tax, but it's, it's a possibility that that, 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 it, that that could be the case. How would such a system operate given the Scottish ability to change tax bans? Would that be a problem for us? I don't think that's uh, an issue because the block grant adjustment is a calculation based on uh, this counterfactual of what would have been raised in Scotland had income tax not been devolved in the first place. So I don't think having a different tax system in Scotland is an issue. But what's an issue is um, whether the distribution of income tax payers in, in Scotland uh, relative to our UK is such that the, the way the block grant adjustment is calculated um, implies that Scottish revenues would have grown more quickly than actually they would have done given the distribution of taxpayers. James. Okay, thanks. Can I ask Caroline just on this issue of speeding up the reconciliation process? Uh, have you got any ideas in terms of alternative data sets that might be available to feed into the reconciliation process to improve it and potentially feed it up? Sorry, speed it up. I'm not sure there's much I can add to what Elaine said. I think the problem is that um, we, we do it well already for the devolved taxes and they're small, so the, the total impact on the budget isn't significant. Um, for income tax, um, I think for people who process all of their income through payers you earn, there probably is room to speed it up. I know less about HMRC than Elaine does, but it seems to me that we know that the way employers are having to submit real-time data, um, that should be possible to, to bring through more quickly than it currently does. But I think most of the income tax collected from higher rate and additional rate taxpayers um, isn't known and often isn't paid until well after the end of the, the fiscal year. Um, and it's that which is the most variable variable bit in relative terms for Scotland anyway. Um, we know that one of the reasons, or we suspect that one of the reasons why the figures that we've just had um, for the first time on Scottish taxpayers 
it's lower than was expected from the survey of personal incomes is because we have fewer of those people than we thought um, based on a, a sort of statistical calculation. Um, there's a suspicion also that the state of the oil and gas industry in the northeast is playing into that, um, bringing down the relative numbers. I think it's hard to see how we can bring that through significantly earlier in ways that would let us bring it right to the front end of the process so that you've got more certain numbers going into the budget rather than reconciling two, two and a half, three years afterwards as we currently have to. Um, I think it's well worth exploring that and it might be one of the things that um, Parliament wants to do, government wants to do as part of reviewing the fiscal framework. Um, but my sense is there's not much we can do about the areas where it would be most important, where there's most variability and most impact on the budget. That's before we get to the AT and all of the uncertainties there are about that um, with the data not being available and no agreed methodology yet for allocating it. Great. Do any other members around that you want to talk about the fiscal framework issues at this stage? Can I ask a general question in that case, just to give some help to the committee in, where, in the direction we go? In terms of that issue we started with, the OBR and the Scottish Fiscal Commission producing different forecasts, is there a general agreement that we need to ensure there's a greater discussion between both of these bodies, at least a greater discussion between both of these bodies, um, a greater understanding of each other's methodology and perhaps more coordination uh, so that we avoid some of the surprising forecast differences. Would anybody, is, is everybody in general agreement with that? If, you, if you're not, tell me so that we can, but if, is there a general agreement and that's something we need to do? I'm not seeing somebody saying no. Caroline. I'd be surprised if there wasn't general agreement yeah, about it. Um, I think it is important um, that that doesn't compromise the independence yeah, of either body, yeah, given their that. accountabilities to their parliaments. Um, and I also picked up the um, focus in this committee's deliberations recently about um, the Fiscal Commission's access to some UK data, like DWP data. Um, and it seems to me that's another part of the yeah. same mix that's well worth getting resolved sooner rather than later. Well, uh, we're going to leave that, I think, to our social... Um, Social, uh, what the committee's name is? Social Security Committee's, uh, and their remit, because uh, rather than the Finance Committee, but it's a, it's a good point to raise because it was something that surprised us when it came up in, in evidence. With that, Murdoch, I'm going to move on to the area of relative economic growth and structure of the Scottish economy. Please kick that this. Um, thank you, uh, Convener. Um, Jenny, in, in, in the previous session, kind of strayed into this territory a little bit, um, but I just wanted to, to, to frame. The discussion around uh, the, the impact of the fiscal framework, and we and we know it is that the relative growth of the uh, UK economy, or more specifically, the relative growth of uh, Scottish tax take relative to UK tax take, that will impact on the amount of money available uh, to the Scottish budget, which we are uh, going to be scrutinising um, in uh, some weeks or months' time. And I'm interested in getting some views around you know, what impact is likely to have on the budget, given what we know about movements between Scottish growth and UK growth. And without getting into a discussion around the constitutional arrangements, in terms of the levers that are available to the Scottish Government uh, that might influence uh, the rate of economic or wage growth in Scotland, how the Scottish Government might use these to try and ensure that uh, we're maximising uh, the, the benefit to the Scottish budget and therefore the Scottish public finances. Jenny. Sorry, Mary. Um, thank you very much, Kavina. Um, so I thought as um, here representing um, the business community in Scotland, um, we it's 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 obviously clear that uh, with um, the fiscal framework being what it is today, um, Growing the economy is increasingly critical uh, to Scottish public finances. Uh, we would um, obviously argue that uh, the private sector growth is and will remain the key to unlocking economic growth. Um, straying into the demographics, but with the demographic challenges that Scotland has, businesses growing and continuing to create jobs um, will be necessary to help secure sustainable public finances for the long term, as well as a widening of the tax base. Um, you, you talked about levers the Scottish Government has. Um, someone mentioned uh, productivity earlier. Obviously, um, 
improving Scotland's overall productivity performance will be um, quite critical uh, if we are growing the economy and raising living standards. Um, while we may have caught up <coughs> with the rest of the UK when it comes to those, um, when it comes to productivity, we're still uh, lagging behind international uh, competitors. And the way we see it is very much a shared challenge uh, between business and government. Um, and there's no silver bullet for it. But I think there are some levers there to uh, be used, um, areas such as exports, investment, infrastructure and skills are all areas where um, changes can be made, which are within the gift of the Scottish Government, um, which um, can help us uh, push some of those uh, productivity performances uh, forward as well as um, growing the, the, the economy. Helen? We're at an interesting time, really, in terms of, of, of our economy here in Scotland. And I think, while I have sympathy for some of what Mary is saying about the need to grow the economy, I think we do also need to focus on uh, wage growth in particular within that. Um, I think from the last discussion, we heard quite a lot about the fact that actually we've got quite a, a, a low wage base here in Scotland and that one of the things that we could focus on quite usefully is moving people up through the income tax bans and into better quality and higher paid jobs, which isn't simply about growing the economy, it's actually about improving the quality of work that's on offer and improving maybe the, the, the skills levels that um, are associated around that work. Um, I think we've, we're also at an interesting time given that our labour market is actually very tight and um, we're running at very low levels of unemployment um, but yet we're still facing some really um, quite interesting demographic challenges so we've got an ageing workforce we also potentially have our access to immigration um, changing in the next period with uh, with differences within um, with the limitation of freedom of movement and also the fact that some of our EU nationals unfortunately feel um, somewhat unwelcome in the country because of some of the debates around the EU and are potentially um, going to, to leave Scotland as a result. And I think that creates a real challenge about how we supply that labour in, into certain key sectors of the economy. And I think we need to think about, again, how it is that we um, ensure that, that those jobs are filled, we ensure that those jobs are good quality and that they're attractive jobs. And, you know, I think that those are difficult questions for us at the same time of considering some of these issues. Um, the question around productivity is also potentially quite interesting because we're about to see um, high levels of automation potentially within the economy, which could improve productivity rates on paper, but doesn't necessarily increase income tax take, um, given that it might replace jobs. So again, there, there are changes in how we potentially have to look at the economy and think about the economy. So really, for us, I think that the main thing is how it is that we ensure quality work and how it is that we ensure high wages within this. Uh, Patrick. Thanks very much. Um, I just wanted to pick up on, on some of the uh, STUC's earlier comments on, on tax policy. I think there, there was a paper from last year that was advocating uh, a broader tax base, particularly at the local level. Now, at the moment, local government is a fairly sizable chunk of, this, of the Scottish budget overall. Uh, and uh, it's already been commented that the fully devolved taxes are a relatively small proportion of that budget. What potential role is there for a broader tax base at local level, not only to, to decouple the, the reliance of local government on a block grant, uh, but also to, to raise revenue in a way that's totally separate from the fiscal framework uh, and, uh, and, and would potentially reduce the, the vulnerability of, uh, of, of revenues that are dependent on economic growth alone? Uh, sorry. Is that, yeah. um, I absolutely ag agree that that's a really key issue and, and one that the STC has been um, doing quite a bit of work on. We had our paper last year, as you mentioned, but we've also now um, commissioned the IPPR or working with the IPPR to produce a more detailed report about what would be on what would be an offer in terms of local taxation um, in order to do exactly the things that you just described. Um, we do think it's really important that we maximise all the tools available to local councils to raise their own revenue and I think there would be quite 
have significant tools in that area. Um, and we also need to think about local authorities being empowered to, to grow their own economy and to do what's right for their own local area. Um, we've been discussing for quite a while the need to focus on the foundational economy and to focus on um, the real economy, as some people might call it, and to think about how it is that we ensure that money stays in a local area rather than sort of drifts off into sort of big multinational companies that potentially then, then take it somewhere else. Um, and there's been some quite good in, um, results from Preston, for example, in using procurement um, in a very localised way that maintains uh, the money in the area and supports local economies in that respect. And I think for Scotland, given the rural dimensions, given the the, the sort of the, some of the challenges that we have, that kind of approach could pay quite large dividends um, in terms of co providing quality jobs and pr providing quality public services in local areas be interested if there's anybody else who's got a role on that the, the, that question, the, the, a, a view on the role of broadening the tax base as a way of increasing revenues uh, as opposed to changing the level of economic activity. Um, yeah, if I can just first um, reinforce the points on the growth in the economy and the importance of, of growing the overall economy and productivity and picking up on the points that the CBI made. We, we've also done a lot of research on regional productivity product Activity and growth across the regions. So again, really focusing on particularly on management and leadership skills, and that's a, a job for, for business to do around exports and innovation. And But lifelong learning we're seeing is much more important. So Scotland is great. We've got fantastic universities. We've got fantastic graduates. Um, but it really is about how we scale up the workforce overall if they're going to be able to take advantage of those higher, higher paid um, jobs that hopefully we're creating. So I just wanted to make that point on that. When, when you unpack that, you then get down to what happens in a place. Um, and so it picks up on Patrick's point there. So if you're, if you're then looking about, well, how do we grow a city region economy, for example, what practically do we need to do uh, to drive that, that economic growth? So having vibrant city regions focused on growing their economy for the benefit of all their citizens we see is very important and, and we're seeing that across the UK but obviously here in Scotland. So so there, there are mechanisms available and say the Glasgow uh, region city deal where um, they're on the hook for economic growth in order to unlock the, the funds that, that will come through the city deal is, is one area. Um, there's a lot of work being done on land value capture, which I appreciate is a, a very sensitive um, topic, but there's a lot of work going on on that, particularly in London. We did some work with TfL on that, um, and others are looking at it. So, again, that is a potential uh, source that will need you know, very, very detailed consideration and it, it, it is sensitive but it's it's a new area that people are looking at. Mary? Um, yeah I, I thought I'd, I'd come in on that as well in terms of um, growing the local economy um, as well as kind of looking at, at the Scottish economy in sort of a macro level. Um, nearly 80% of employment in, in Scotland is in the private sector so obviously um, it's, it's important to um, support and, and grow that uh, business base, be it small, medium or large. Um, and I think it's interesting um, in terms of using uh, procurement as a way of, of, of getting people to, um, uh, attracted to, to a locality. And um, it's something I'll, I'll, I'll look into more because it sounds very interesting. But I think also in terms of local employment, and, and finding ways uh, of um, encouraging job creation um, in different places in Scotland. I think the infrastructure point comes in there quite significantly in terms of digital infrastructure. It also um, picks up the point in terms of um, technology changing. I think um, that is one area where we are only seeing the beginning of, of a changing um, uh, world of work and in order to support that there are the sort of key components of having digital infrastructure that can uh, support that as well as the skills element that has already been mentioned and 
uh, when you think about the fact that uh, what is the stat that 80% of the workforce today are due to still be of working age in 2030, uh, there's clearly much that needs to be done when it comes to supporting in-work training uh, and upskilling on the job. Jim? Yeah, yeah. I'm very interested in the discussion about, about, about localisation of the tax base and um, uh, you know, clearly, in, in some respects, income tax is not the, a good tax for basing our funding of the Scottish, Scottish government on. Um, you know, we, we're weak in income tax, a, a lower than population share of, of, of receipts, etc. And the point made by Helen about the potential effect of uh, automation income tax is, I think, an important one. So broadening the tax base is, is to be encouraged. But I think there's a couple of issues that one would need to look at. I mean, a, a feature of the fiscal settlement that has greatly worried me is the potential for negative feedback effects, that if we respond to a shortage of resources in Scotland by raising tax rates, we just potentially make the matter worse and get into a downward, downward cycle. So you... The Scottish Government would need to be keeping a close eye on that, and if you're localising tax decisions, they would need to have some, some form of central control that, if necessary, could put the brakes upon um, in increasing local tax rates to, to, stop these negative, to stop these negative feedback effects. The other problem with localising tax decisions is the one of inconsistent assumptions. I mean, this is a big danger about um, tax incremental financing, etc., that each local authority assumes that it is going to do it uh, and increase its revenue base and makes assumptions uh, 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 accordingly. But when you look at the overall assumption, what they're, what they're assuming, you know, the, the national aggregate of their collective assumptions might be clearly un unfeasible. So again, you've got to have a, very, a, a strong centre who's able to keep an eye on, on that and making sure that spending plans and tax plans made, made locally are in some sense nationally consistent. So I think these are things that you need to look at if you're going down this road of, of broadening the tax base on the local, local level. But in principle, we do need to broaden the, the tax base. Carly? Thank you. Um, I need to be careful in response to Patrick Harvey's question because clearly um, policy uh, questions are outside my remit, but I think it's, it's safe to say that the package of tax measures we've got in Scotland wasn't designed for its coherence, um, that there are things in there that um, perhaps don't join together and some bits missing. We all understand the reasons for that. Um, I think while we're looking at that package of tax measures, it's inevitable we have to look at the taxes that aren't within the fiscal framework themselves, so local taxation, um, the theoretical freedom to introduce new taxes and to be planning for what might look like a more coherent um, set of uh, measures that would work together um, as a sustainable longer term approach to the public finances. Um, the other point I wanted to make was picking up the um, comment from um, uh, the CBI about infrastructure because it seems to me that's absolutely right um, and I think um, we often think about that in terms of big uh, bricks and mortar type um, investment, I think we need to be moving away from that. We published a report recently on broadband and the challenges of getting broadband coverage, super fast broadband right across Scotland in the areas where potentially it could make the most difference to economic activity. Um, lots of investment from government, but some real challenges in how you do it. Thinking beyond that, I think um, if you look at, for example, the percentage of registrations of new vehicles that are electric, um, I think in Norway it's around 40%, for the UK it's around 3%, and I suspect it's quite a lot lower than that in Scotland because of our geography and the availability of charging points. Um, I've got a concern that the, um, the attention that's placed on the infrastructure investment budget as part of the overall budget is quite fragmented. Um, we tend to look at it through funding streams, through capital borrowing, through capital Dell, um, through the uh, PPP, PFI stream of investment, rather than standing back and saying, what's the pipeline of potential investment? How are we making choices about that across different types of infrastructure across different parts of Scotland? And I think that's something Parliament might want to be thinking about as part of the new budget process. Inevitably, there are choices involved in that and political considerations, but I think having that big picture over a longer period of time would help to make longer-term choices that are more sustainable. Ellen? Um, yeah, just a, a small plea to not focus too much on simply digital infrastructure and forget um, the bricks and mortar kind of infrastructure, which I think in Scotland needs a lot of attention. Um, you know, we have an, an ageing ferry fleet. We have a lot of problems with our connectivity in terms of rail, in terms of road, particularly to the north of Scotland. I think it's really important that those things are considered in the round, actually, because um, we'll never really get the economic growth, particularly in the north, that we need without that infrastructure development. 
I've got quite a few people want to contribute. I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back to you. Don't worry, we've got time on this. But Tom. Thank you, Convener. Just picking up on a point that uh, Caroline made, and which she characterised the package of taxes in Scotland within the fiscal uh, framework as uh, lacking coherence. Um, clearly, there's an absence of some taxes, and they are still reserved to Westminster. Um, Murdo kicked off this. Uh, conversation by asking about the levers that the Scottish government has which influence the Scottish economy. I'd like to hear views on what levers are exercised by the UK government that determine economic growth and wage growth in Scotland. Okay. If somebody would like to try and pick that up, I'll come back. I'll, I'll come back to you in a minute because I've got also I've got um, Jenny and Mary both want to contribute. I just want to pick up some of the MSP's comments just to make sure that we're getting everything out. Alex? You can be, um, it was really on the back of what Caroline was uh, saying, but Helen particularly, in talking about the bricks and mortar, um, it was around the construction sector, and I note my register of interests uh, in, in that sector. Yet one of the biggest errors yeah, we've been hearing about in the previous sessions was for, in forecasting was the construction sector, uh, and I think that influences a lot of um, you know, in, you know, decisions made about improving productivity in, in that sector. I just wonder if uh, the, the panel had any comments about improving uh, some of the data forecasting so that some of those decisions can be improved. Okay, and Angela, then I'll come back to... Uh, yes. you know, I, I was interested to hear more about place-based uh, approaches. I'm familiar a little bit with the Preston um, experience and how they increased uh, the proportion of their uh, local government budget, how that's in invested locally. But I wondered if we could uh, take that step further, whether the, the Preston experience or other experiences demonstrated uh, how particular place-based approaches could actually increase uh, the income tax uh, take and also, uh, in Helen's point about the importance of infrastructure, um, housing is an important local and national um, investment. Um, and I wonder if there's any up-to-date work being done that demonstrates uh, the very clear uh, economic uh, impact and investment in housing. There's quite a few themes coming through here, folks. So I, I, I'm not expecting Jenny and Mary, and Mary to pick up on all of these things that have just been mentioned. But if you can pick up on the ones you wish to, um, Jenny and then Mary. Um, where to start? If I could just pick up on the numbers and the construction sector point, because um, I think it, we look back, the economic growth figures suddenly um, improved, obviously, for quarter one. 2018, and that was great. You know, growth went from 0.2 to 0.4. That's great, but I think you just have to be aware and, and really focus in on what's the actual position as opposed to the growth rate. So, if your growth, if your economy is 100, and it was previously 99, then you've grown by 1%. But if you look back at your figures and you think, well, actually, it used to be 95, then suddenly you've had a massive growth rate, but the actual position hasn't changed any. So I think just keeping an eye on not just the growth rate, but actually what's happening underlying in the economy is, is, is pretty important. Um, on, on the infrastructure point, um, I absolutely agree with, with, with Caroline around having that overview of, of the whole of, of infrastructure and being able to make trade-offs. Now, it's always, I did the, the Howard Review in 2005, 2007, I, you know, these are always ultimately political choices, but there is much, there are now much better economic modelling tools available um, that allow you to measure the trade-offs and the impacts of different types of infrastructure. And in some ways, because I know the Glasgow City Region and that, that deal best, you know, that's quite a good example, but things have moved on even since then around how you can how you can assess those different impacts. And I think that's something that um, you know we'd, we'd want to see further developed to allow you to have the, the information needed to, to make those um, to make those trade offs. Um, the importance of housing is, is so ultimately, if you're tr from a place-based approach, ultimately it boils down to you want to attract more more people and you want them to be paid more, so they're paying um, more income tax. So how do you attract more people? How do you make um, a particular, whether it's Scotland or whether it's a city region or whatever, how do you make that more attractive? And there's a lot of work done around, um, obviously, infrastructure about. Cons 
constantly renewing infrastructure. We did work across a whole range of global cities. So it's not just resting on your laurels and saying, right, we've fixed that, it's all fine, everybody will want to come here. Um, so there's, there's about renewal of infrastructure. Housing is absolutely critical, and we all see the population trends and how those are going. But actually, if you can do quite a bit about place, if you can get decent housing, and therefore companies are looking to say, well, actually, this is an attractive place, we will come and invest here. Um, there are huge amounts you can do. And so doing that, particularly at a local level, and having um, city regions, because I agree with, with Jim, if you're just looking at one small tiff or whatever, you're not getting the whole picture, then you can really start to, to attract people. And you know, we are seeing a lot of that good work um, you know, we look at our young people in the firm. You know, if you said 15 years ago they'd all want to um, live in Finiston and whatever, and that, well, you know, it's it's all completely changed now. So there is a lot that can be done, but housing um, is critical. And just while we're on the economy, health as well, we're we're focusing quite a lot of effort on on health as part of that place-based approach to to improving um, local economies. So sorry, I've. I'm not sure no, if I've picked up on everything, but, um, but the, 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 the key one, one point nobody's picked up on yet is uh, Tom's point in regard. To, obviously, we are, we, we are very focused on what happens as far as the Scottish government levers are concerned. But what can the UK government, with its levers, do to help us as well? I think it's a, a, a germane point. Uh, Mary. Um, yeah, that was a point I thought um, initially I'd just uh, pick up on in terms of. Uh, if you see Scotland along with the northeast of England um, are the two areas of the UK that are projected to see a reduction in total available workforce uh, by 2025. Um, that then means that we need a UK immigration policy that's fit for purpose uh, post-Brexit. Um, so I think um, that is one area that's obviously... Uh, one that needs to be um, addressed at a UK government um, level. I think from the businesses we've spoken to so far, um, I'm, I'm, I'm verging into the, obviously the, the demographic kind of uh, question of, of it, but if, if you permit me, um, we've uh, the businesses we've spoken to so far have said in terms of devolving um, immigration powers that now is not the right time, uh, rather focus on getting the uh, UK immigration system right um, in response to uh, uh, Brexit. Um, obviously, if it becomes uh, a very restrictive system, then um, flexibilities for Scotland would need to be addressed uh, in some uh, shape or form, but obviously this is a uh, still a, a moving feast, but I, I just wanted to pick up on that point. Um, then there was a point about housing. Um, Is that yeah. a point, Mary? Because uh, uh, before we got to Brexit, these <laughs> indicators were still emerging for the Scottish economy and for the North East. And, and I, I don't want to forget about what's going on in the real world where we are just now. But are there any other specific policy levers that should be being pulled by either the UK government or the Scottish Government in relation to that demographic change that we should have been doing anyway before we got to this my, the, the situation we're currently facing around migration because there may be things that we should be employing in any case. And I'd like, because that's a, a theme that's come through in a number of discussions, so I'd like to just unpick that a bit more. Have the CBI have got any particular levers you think we, could, we should be pulling? I, I think still kind of taking it back to the skills point as well, um, after the financial crisis, rightly so, we focused on supporting young people and 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 the skills needed to enter the workplace, um, and that's still important. But I think there also needs to be uh, more of a focus on our current workforce that will be um, working, as I said before, for some time. So. Um, a clear policy lever is is getting a skills policy that is fit to address those challenges, which includes what's been mentioned before in terms of lifelong learning um, and in work training. Sorry, I interrupted your floor. You were going to address other issues. Yeah, no, I, I was just going to say on the, on on housing. Obviously, um, 
it's a crucial part of, of that um, sort of macroeconomic picture. And again, key levers that the Scottish government has there is around planning policy um, and also around skills, uh, because I think the construction industry as a whole sees a, a number of different challenges when it comes to um, both attracting people into the industry, but also training them in the various different skills that are required within it. Um, and then adding on to that, planning policy then needs to be uh, set in a way that actually encourages them to, to build more homes. Caroline and Jenny. Thank you. Um, I wanted to pick up Tom Arthur's um, question about the sort of interaction between Scottish leavers and UK government leavers. Um, and it seems there's a useful link back to the previous um, agenda item the committee was considering about the framework for, for that relationship. One of the things we haven't talked about today is that the, um, the UK government's decisions about the mix of tax and spending measures that it wants to take can be budget neutral at a UK level, but affect Scotland's fiscal position. So, for example, if they shifted from um, income tax to corporation tax within the overall mix, that would have an impact on income tax take here um, because of the way in which the block grant adjustment works, but it wouldn't um, have uh, Barnet consequentials that would push the block grant element back up again, and obviously vice versa. Um, and it seems to me that that's a very good example of why we need to have much better dialogue between the two governments, the two parliaments, about what the overall direction is, um, so that we can be at least understanding the consequences of some of that, and then thinking through the way that it might work in practice, reflecting again that this is a, a political um, world that, that you're all operating in, um, but doing what we can to, to minimise the scope for sort of tit for tat or for um, defensive decisions being taken in advance of a conversation about what the, what the overall good might be. Again, I think it brings me back to this point that we are still finding our way through how this framework will actually work in practice um, in ways that we don't, we don't fully understand the consequences of, and there is a risk of quite serious consequences of decisions being taken in a, um, a, a less than fully informed way at this stage. It's quite helpful because tomorrow we've got the Chief Secretary of the Treasury coming to speak to us, so that's a useful thing we can be picking up. Come in a minute, Jim. Jenny? Um, yeah, and just just to follow up on on that particular point and reinforce what Caroline was saying, um, so one of the particular areas might be um, high net worth individuals who own their own businesses, for example. Going back to that small number at the top, there is obviously a common view that if income tax goes up at the the top level, then potentially those people convert to. Um, to take dividends from their, their company, which then would impact from the Scottish tax rate, but would, would increase tax at the UK level. However, there's also the possibility that those business owners decide to leave their cash in the business, and both the UK and the Scottish Government end up with a reduced tax take as a result. So it's, it's just some of these interesting um, implications that um, we need to tease out. On the, on the point around... Um, UK and, and Scottish Government policy levers, again, I agree with what Caroline said. One specific point around, um, obviously there's a lot of effort on the industrial strategy at the moment at, at UK level and within the firm, I've got a UK role as well and I sit in our group and on response to the industrial strategy and Brexit. Um, but on the industrial strategy, there's a lot going on there. The Scottish Government have their own policies. Um, there are different levels of support available either through Scottish Enterprise or indeed through the industrial strategy. So I think both governments are, are talking, but I think if you're an individual business owner, you don't really care whether the funding is coming from the UK government or a Scottish government funded programme, but you want to be able to access that easily. So I think um, there is there is potentially more that, that both sides could do to have a, a coordinated approach so that um, so that each are aware of the other the other programmes. Okay. Yep. One specific example. Speaking with for example of business in my constituency, they pay, pay the real living wage. They're giving incredibly they're incredibly flexible with their employees, but they are struggling to maintain that position because other companies and competitors don't, because they simply meet what the UK requirement is. So, for example, there's a relationship there between employment law and the 
salaries that ultimately employees in Scotland have. And I think this also relates to the question of productivity. There is an argument being made by the IPPR and others that businesses currently are not incentivised to adopt innovations because of existing national living wage and indeed minimum wage levels. So I think when we have these deliberations and debates around productivity and comparing Scotland to the rest of the UK, actually it can be something of a false debate if we have a situation where ultimately the levers that can be used to determine productivity rest with Westminster. We care passionately about and have paid since the right we were involved right from the the, the outset. Um, um, and keen to, keen to see it adopted as far as possible. Um, there's there's quite a good body of evidence that says paying the the real living wage as opposed to the the, the set one actually does drive up. You can do that and, and, and drive productivity improvements at the same time. Um, so there was quite a lot of research done on that. So that's something that would be worth um, publicising more widely, I think. Jim? Yes. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make a, a couple of points. One, one, one on infrastructure. I, mean, I can't agree more that infrastructure is vitally important. But I think an issue that should particularly concern this committee is at what price? And I think there are significant worries about the funding mechanisms for infrastructure. I mean, I have a particular view in the bonnet about um, revenue asset based pricing, um, which you know is a particularly invidious um, 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 variant of current cost pricing, which I think leads us to pay over the odds for things like improvement, particularly in, in rail. Uh, so I think you know that the committee should be interested in that and should be making sure that we're not paying over the odds for infrastructure. Uh, it, there's also an issue about the cost of, for example, hub finance, and Peter Rieke and I have an ongoing debate on that. The pity is not here here today. <laughs> but I think that potentially some of the statements have been made about the cost of SFT finance underestimate the true cost of the of the finance. So I think there's something there that's that, that's important. And then one other aside, uh, 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 Mardo asked about what lever should we be pulling, and one potential lever we've got, um, which we may not have made optimal use of, is um, water charges. Um, I mean, it worries me that the um, Waterminster Commissioner for, for, uh, Commission for Scotland interpret the remit very narrowly and do not take account of a potential effect on economic development. They're waiting for the Scottish Government to give them a steer on that, and I'm not sure the Scottish Government has given them a steer. I think, I think you know, there's an area that, that needs to be explored. We're at a particular juncture just now where, effectively, um, um, you know, we're hardly borrowing for water at, at, at present at all. Um, uh, do we want to continue borrowing to take account of low interest rates? Um, there was worrying stuff in some of the consultor documents produced by, by the Water Inter Commission about the next review of charges, which says that we should be paying now to pay for future replacement. Uh, and that's not a road we want to go down, I don't think. I think we should be making sure that we're getting the cheapest possible uh, water subject with um, w w with prudence, and that could potentially have a major effect upon uh, of an economic development. Okay, listen, Elaine. Uh, while we're going in this conversation, it strikes me that we've not really dealt with some of the smaller taxes, for want of a better description. And LBTT was one of them because if we got a property boom south uh, south of the border, um, uh, and prices, in, well, for whatever reason, prices also increase, which is not impossible. It's happened many times in the South East in particular, that might have a distorting effect on how we deal with um, the mechanism around LBTT between what happens in the rest of the UK and Scotland. And it made, made me think about, in, that, in, that, in these circumstances, how volatile that might be, even though it's a smaller tax, uh, around issues around LBTT. Have you got any views on that from Inland Revenue? From the from Revenue, Revenue Scotland, Scotland, sorry. I'm certainly Revenue not Scotland. Inland Revenue, yes, thank you. Computer. Um, <laughs> Well, well, we've only got three years' worth of data, um, so it's still probably too early to, to draw those sorts of comparisons. But what is evident from the data that we've got is that um, there is reaction in the market um, uh, to changes in tax. So, for example, if you, if you look at our LBTT residential stats, you'll see that when ADS was introduced, there was forestalling before that. You saw there's a spike in property purchases. Um, I understand the question you're asking in terms of the possible Barnet or block grant adjustment consequentials of a boom down south of the border and that not reflecting north of the border. Um, 
And that is something that, um, obviously, Scottish Government officials would need to be keeping an eye on. But these things take time to, to follow through in the system. Um, so the other area that's worth just mentioning is everybody always focuses on residential LBTT. There's non-residential LBTT too. And actually, from the short information that we've got for the first three years, it's actually the more volatile of the taxes. Um, it's also the one which, because it relates to commercial um, property and leases, it's the one which is a good one to look at in terms of what's happening in the economy. Um, but what you can see is from our non-residential LBTT is that where there is a spike um, and uh, there it can be because of uh, one significant transaction that's happened in Scotland. So in terms of volatility and impact, um, it's the non-residential LBTT that's worth worth keeping an eye on. Listen, we need to move on to the other areas because time skills. And Jim, James, I might have already started to stray, unfortunately, into the territory you were going to be asking questions on. Forgive me, because we've covered a fair bit of demographic change already, but I'm sure we can still get a bit more out of that. Um, as you say, we've covered some of this in the previous section, but in terms of the demographics, um, I mean, the overall population in Scotland is now at 5.424 uh, million, you know, which has been increasing, which is good. Uh, as we touched on in the previous session, there are issues around migration and immigration. Uh, and the other major issue is the, the growing elderly population over the last 25 years. Um, those in the 65 to 74 age group has grown by 27%, and those over 75 has grown by 31%. So what that therefore means is that you've got people moving from working and paying taxes um, into the, the, the pensioner block of the community. So what, uh, what challenges and risks does that present for the Scottish budget? Right then. There's a heck of a question, but it's and, and when when you're thinking about that, what specific things can we do in Scotland to to address some of these issues? Is there any are there any particular policy levers we could pull if that would help? Jenny, good on you. Thank you. Picking up some points on that. Um, yep, yeah, our population is 5.4 million. We've got a workforce of about 2.6 million ish. Um, I think um, one of the positive sides of, of this, we're seeing more and more people in older age groups still working. Um, and so when we look at the tight labour market, actually there's potentially some, some untapped potential there. Um, obviously some people are continuing to work because they, they have to, but many more because they want to and they want to, to stay engaged. And they are, while um, I absolutely recognise the challenges for the NHS at the older age group, actually that 65 to 74 year old age group are much healthier than they, they were in, in, in previous um, times and I hope that continues. Um, so, um, <laughs> so, 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 so there are definitely challenges, there, there are um, potentially uh, some opportunities to be looked at around that. Um, on as, as we talked earlier, you know, fundamentally, we, we want more people in Scotland. Um, particular policy leave us. The po post-study work visa, which used to be in place, is something that um, I think would be would be particularly helpful if we could have um, reintroduced or some version of that. There are some pilots going on uh, at the moment, but more more of that. I think, given the the impact of Brexit, as we're seeing, we've seen the latest net, net migration figures, and we know that um, far fewer EU nationals are already um, not coming uh, to the UK. Um, I think th the interesting piece about the latest Scottish data was that we were attracting more people from elsewhere in the UK to Scotland. And so in terms of um, future policy development, and going back to that place-based discussion we had earlier, really focusing on how we can attract more people from the rest of the UK uh, into Scotland, I think, is something worth considering. Caroline? Thank you. Um, I thought the splice paper on demographic change was really 
excellent and helpful um, and in some ways there's not much to add to the, the issues that it sets out there. Um, I had a couple of thoughts I think responding to Neil Bibby's question. The first is that that paper understandably focuses on the revenue side of the equation. Um, lots of our work in Audit Scotland is about the spending side um, and I think that you've, you've got the risk of a double whammy there as you hinted. Um, on that, the fiscal outlook um, document, I agree with Jenny, is a great step forward and it's good to have it. If I had a criticism, I think it's stronger on the revenue forecasts than it is on the expenditure forecasts and what's likely to drive them. And we can do more to um, look at what the likely impact is of the, the demographic change we know is happening over the next 30 years. Um, I think our work has shown that the policy response to that is the right one. The integration of health and social care, um, moving lots of the care that people need out of hospitals where it costs more and it's not as good for individuals and delivering it much more close to their homes has to be right. But the pace of change is still way too slow for the, the pace of demographic change that we're seeing around that. And I think that's a really good example of where a place-based response can um, not just um, help older people themselves, but also have real benefits for the local community more widely. Um, I'm really interested in um, quite small third sector initiatives like Food Train in Dumfries, where it first started, where you've got people um, in a local community helping older people who are just about managing at home, doing their food shopping for them, so a small intervention. But it means that, that, that people in the community get to know the older person, can spot when they're starting to struggle, can talk to the GP practice and get a bit more help in. And you get benefits for the volunteers who are often older people themselves who get a, a sort of boost from, from helping their older neighbours or younger people with learning disabilities or mental health problems so just again building their ability to feel useful and to, to sort of hold down a responsible role so I think those sorts of place-based um, responses can be really powerful and with, there's room for much more of them and for them to be part of the whole approach to community empowerment um, one other dimension just very briefly to mention which I think is, um, again, going back to the, the potential interaction between the UK and Scottish government responses, and that's around pension taxation changes. Um, we're seeing, for reasons that I fully understand, um, a reduction in the amount of tax relief that higher rate taxpayers can receive on their pensions in terms of both annual and um, lifetime allowances. There's increasing evidence that that's having some unintended consequences for people like doctors, who in their 50s are coming up against their caps yep. and are making decisions about whether to continue working or not. Um, now, that's not great for public services, but it's also likely to put further pressure on the number of higher rate taxpayers we have in Scotland and therefore the consequences of the um, fiscal framework as it currently stands. I don't think we understand that well enough yet, but we can see it coming through. It's a good example. Helen and then Emma. Um, Yes, I think I think I agree with quite a, a lot of the points made about um, the role of older workers in the workforce. I think there has been actually some really good work already done by some employers about um, supporting workers to stay on at work. And I think um, taking a kind of fair work approach to this is is a really is a really useful way to think about it. And um, you know, far be it for me to advocate a work till you drop society. It's certainly not that. But um, what I do think is that. A lot of workers do get a lot out of being able to stay on in the workforce, being able to keep their skills um, in work. And um, if that's something that we can do that supports the employer and supports the worker in a really positive way, then that would be that would that would be really good for the economy, I think. Um, in terms of immigration, um, Brexit, I think, does present a really significant challenge. And it's clear from what the UK government has said so far that they're they're not necessarily going to um, maintain low-skilled immigration routes into the UK. I mean, they had talked a wee bit about perhaps agriculture, there being a specific visa for agriculture, but beyond that, um, it, it, there, there may not be that many that, that many routes that replace the, the EU national routes. Um, I think just glancing at the sort of figures around payment for UK workers versus non-EU workers versus EU workers, you can see that EU workers, despite being very well qualified workers, are often holding quite low paid jobs. So the median hour, hourly pay for an EU worker is £8.60, whereas for a UK worker it was £11.20 and for a non-EU worker it was £13.20. So you can kind of see that the non-EU workers are coming in on high skilled visas, in uh, taking up high, um, high rates of paid jobs, and that's reflected in the sort of pay packet 
um, that those workers are taken home, but EU workers are, are, are often doing different roles in the economy, which will, and we'll need to think about how those roles are filled in the future if that immigration route is not there. And one of the things that I think is very clear that we'll need to think about is the treatment of workers in those sectors. Um, the STC did some uh, work in Sky this summer about the treatment of um, hospitality workers and found that um, workers were having to pay £50 a week for access to accommodation that amounted to staff bunks that were shared between workers and um, between shifts. It was in very, very poor terms and conditions. And um, I think those sorts of issues around access to housing and um, and in particular rural areas of Scotland really affect how much the tourism industry will be able to grow in the context where um, they will actually have to start providing proper um, accommodation for workers. So I think there's a whole myriad of issues in there about um, how it is that we protect workers' rights going forward. And it, it, there are some questions about the UK's response to Brexit and how some of these things may be eroded in future trade deals as well that we're, we are certainly quite concerned about. Yep, I've got a couple of you I want to contribute. Jim, and then it just strike me, and particularly in the tourism situation, there was a, with the cross-party group in tourism last week with this the whole issue of immigration and how people are treated in the industry was to the fore. But what, if, if the, the one of the biggest pools out there, those over 65, why the, why the tourism is not tapping into that group who are who will be staying in Sky and providing them with opportunities and encouraging them to go in. I think it's something we probably need to think about. I'm going to come back to you, Mary, on that question before we leave it, about what is industry doing to encourage older people to stay on if they want to? Because um, I think that's one of the areas we need to look at as a, for, for the economy. But Jim, sorry. I, I, I thought the, the Spice paper and demography was excellent and great food for thought. Um, but it strikes me that some of the problems um, are longer terms, and we should, this is something that should be built into the review of the fiscal framework. And it's almost dangerous to come up with ideas off the top of one's head, but one possibility would be one could move to, an, instead of the index per capita method of indexation, the index per working age capita might address some of these, some of these problems. The second thing is, um, we, in, in that review, we should not sh shy away from an assessment, bringing an assessment of needs in at some stage. I mean, it was interesting the extent to which the existing fiscal framework really weakened the basis of the UK monetary union. A proper monetary union takes account of need in assessing fiscal flows. And in some way, when we're doing a review, I think we should be bringing assessment of need into the mix as well. Emma, and then Angela. Thank you, convener. It's been really interesting to hear everybody's contributions this morning, actually. And I am interested in some of the issues around recruitment and recruitment of health staff, GPs, radiologists. The area of the south of Scotland is also an area of low economy and high tourism. And, of course, agriculture is a big issue. The NFU um, president actually uh, argued that uh, rural workforce is actually a skilled workforce. So that's something that I think we need to consider. And I do support an immigration policy that works for particular recruitment issues in Scotland. So as we move forward with investment in infrastructure, whether it's physical or digital or whatever, is there a natural, I guess, flow of people that will be recruited or moved to an area, especially if the house prices are less, such as in Dumfries and Galloway. Is it not just a natural progression, or do the governments really, really do need to find what programmes and processes that they can do to um, bring migrants, immigrants, UK migrants here too? I'm going to come back to Jenny and Mary, who can reflect on some of these questions that, ever, that are being raised as we go along, because I know that they'd raised them. I'm going to get a number of MSPs in now, though. Angela and then Willie, so that we can get some other thoughts into the process. Um, thank you, convener. I mean, given that the, uh, we're heading for a, a divergence in the dependency ratio, not that I, I like that um, label, um, and that we know that, that migration has uh, a strong and lasting impact on population growth that helps to uh, alleviate the transition to an aging population, although doesn't, you know, um, entirely um, o o overcome. Um, I, I would be grateful if our, if our guests could um, really help us distill, you know, what, what can the Scottish Government do uh, to mitigate, um, you know, what 
is and isn't the case for a, a policy uh, divergence uh, on things such as uh, migration. Um, how could the UK and the Scottish Government be working better um, on this? And picking up on Jim Cuthbert's point is that, you know, what other ideas are there um, for the fiscal framework uh, to um, take into account um, the, the overall age profile and, you know, the, the impacts um, from having a relatively higher um, ageing population um, compared to the UK, given that some of this, uh, particularly in terms of immigration and migration, is not within our gift or control. Willie. Uh, thanks, Bruce. It's kind of related to that, but it's, it's really about with the digital economy, the focus of it has been mentioned by a few people around the table today. Uh, as we know, and I don't want to drop into the politics of this, but we're, we're going to be walking away from the digital single market, we think, which is worth about €400 billion Euros a year and supports hundreds of thousands of jobs. So if Scotland's facing this demographic time bomb, why on earth are we doing to ourselves something like that that will further reduce the skill base, particularly the IT skill base, which is already in short supply in Scotland at the moment? So the members, without asking you politically loaded questions, is there, is there anything we can do to try to reverse that or influence some kind of change to draw in the kind of skills and talents that we really need to move forward? There's been a lot of points made, a lot of issues raised, and I, I, I can't expect everybody to cover everything. I, I, I appreciate that. But Jenny, would you like to yeah, begin a sort of response? Of things. Um, Caroline mentioned earlier um, the changes, the interplay between pensions and other things, and, and, and people at the higher end bumping up against their cap. Now, the in, one of the interesting things about that is if they don't retire and continue to work and are not then putting more into their pension, then actually that's trans, that means they're paying more income tax. So that's a, a potentially positive benefit for the public finances in, in that sense. So again, some, that, that would, I would look at that. Um, I think on the spend side, um, we, we've, we have talked a lot about the tax side, but the spend side, there's just a lot more that we could do to understand that better. Um, so just going back to the infrastructure point, yes, you know, infrastructure is good, but one piece of infrastructure can be a lot better than others. So by way of example, um, when we were doing the Manchester City deal, there were two tram schemes, exactly the same cost, 800 million each. But in terms of economic benefit, it was a factor of 10 to 1. And so it's it's really important to get that analysis of what's the opportunity, you know, what's the spend, what's the, what's the benefits, what's the opportunity cost, some more rigour around that. Um, on the migration side, I'd already said something along the post-study work visa side of things would be helpful at the UK level. We as a company and, and many other businesses, as I'm sure the CBI know well, um, are struggling with the tier two, so we can't get people in because of the tier two caps, we're having people not being able to join us uh, because of that, so, so it is um, constraining. Um, I think the dependency ratio is really interesting, um, and I think if I were a policy maker, I, I would be getting some work done on how, whether, whether the dependency ratio is exactly right for now because the workforce has changed so much we've talked about older workers being in the workforce and we use a kind of standard uh, measure of the dependency ratio to then calculate potential costs potential benefits um so again if i had some <laughs> spare time I, th I think that would be something that it would be worth looking at as to whether that's the right basis going going forward um and just one final point around flexibility and policy choices if as we as we are seeing that there's a lot of money potentially we could be 500 million adrift or 250 million adrift i think it's really really important to understand um flexible policy choices where you can turn the tap on and and off and obviously it's hugely complex and hugely difficult for public services but really understanding what flexibility exists within the within the system to do that. So, for example, early years, you know, we, there's obviously a big commitment to provide for that. But is that something where you can um, flex if, if money's tight? I'm not necessarily advocating one way or other, but, but as an illustration, um, 
of the point. So, so having that flexibility in policy, I think, is, is pretty important. Uh, data we've talked about. Obviously, you're having to use standard data sets in order to set the budget, but we're getting lots of real-time data through that lets us know whether things are on track. So going back to what Elaine was, was saying earlier about commercial property and, and residential. So we know that Scotland in the last six months has had way more co commercial property investment, uh, highest for quite some years. So if anything, and, and we know that the south and the southeast is, is struggling. So actually, if anything, the balance is going the other way. We, we've done um, some forecasts for future house prices, and we're showing that house prices in Scotland are going to continue to grow at higher rates for the next five years, whereas London is our estimate, our chief economist estimate is London will drop um, and the other regions will go up a bit, but not nearly as much as they have been going up. So again, <coughs> by getting that real-time data that's coming through, it won't particularly help you in your budget setting because you need that historic data, but it's certainly there and available for policymakers to know whether you're on track and what where the potential gaps may or may not be. Wow, thank you. You covered a lot of ground there. Thanks, Jenny. Mary? Um, yeah, I can pick up on the point in terms of helping all the workers as well, if, if that's helpful. So um, in terms of helping all the, all the people stay on in work, um, there's obviously an important role there for employers in terms of um, offering flexible um, working um, opportunities um, and sort of working around different uh, needs um, as they arise. Um, I'd like to point to Age Scotland are doing some interesting work around this in terms of having a different approach to retirement um, and encouraging um, older workers to also consider sort of staying on a, on a I guess, a, a reduced um, uh, kind of scaling back their work patterns and staying on as a sort of almost like a mentor type role um, as, as, as one way of approaching retirement. Um, again, the in-work training element is important in this in terms of supporting all the workers um, as work, uh, well, business operations technologies are changing. Uh, we have a flexible workforce development fund that is a mechanism that could potentially help some of that if it lived up to the name around flexibility. Um, there was a conversation about how to attract people, I guess, up from the rest of the UK or, or from the outside. Um, we would obviously say that that would uh, be best done through opportunities, through jobs, through investment. Um, I think the STUC point about infrastructure in terms of connectivity, roads, rail, and so forth, um, shouldn't be ignored as well. So yes, digital infrastructure, very important, but getting people to jobs is, is another part of it that is um, essential to, to make Scotland an attractive place to live and work. Um, touching on the point um, around immigration and how to work better together. Obviously, that's um, something for both the UK government and the Scottish government to do uh, in unison. Um, it's not one side or the other. Um, if I can just uh, flag in terms of um, CBI has recently published a report called Open and Controlled um, with some recommendations about a new approach to immigration post-Brexit. Uh, some of the things that we touched on there is um, putting immigration on the table in future trade talks, um, ensuring EU workers are not subject to burdens of non-EU um, visa rules, as well as scrapping blunt targets on immigration. So those would, those would be some of the suggestions we would put forward in terms of making the uh, UK immigration system more responsive to the needs of the economy. What struck me through this discussion, actually, it's the commonality of approach that everyone's actually got. For whatever sector people are coming from, they're saying the same things, but are we going to be heard? Helen? 
Um, <laughs> yeah, I think um, I would agree actually with a lot of what Marsh just said. I mean, I think um, have removing the the cap on migration that is very much politically driven is would be a would be a good start. Um, I think having a much more humane and responsive immigration system would be important too. Um, when it comes to attracting people to Scotland, um, when you're thinking about just even the wider UK workforce, I think one of the things that we shouldn't underestimate is the quality of our public services and some of the approaches that have been taken here in Scotland in terms of maintaining sort of free access to education, um, including higher education, the approach to expanding the childcare and sort of the, the quality of life that we, we have here um, through that kind of investment um, in, in public services, uh, I think is, is really important and is another selling point for Scotland. Um, when it comes to economic development in local areas, however, I think we need to remember sort of the interconnectivity of different issues and um, the fact that we can't simply look at it very bluntly in terms of, well, this is how much we're investing in business relief or this is how much we're investing in um, one sort of uh, project or whatever it needs we need to think about how all the different budget lines work together so you know if bus routes are being eroded if there isn't access to housing it's going to be very difficult for companies uh, to to grow because they simply don't they're, they're not able to to access the workforce and actually we do have quite a large domestic workforce um who who can be tapped into and work is changing so there will be a lot of sectors that are maybe under pressure for example retail where workers are are facing redundancies and are facing a lot of issues and it's how we then support those workers into different opportunities and into into different parts of the economy and i think that comes very much to what mary has been talking about um in terms of uh, lifelong learning and access to, to opportunities for all workers and I think it's it's a very sad situation that so many workers in the economy don't get any access to training at all and you're much less likely to have that support if you're a low-skilled worker and I think that's something that we should be really thinking about as well is how we support low-skilled workers in that respect. Folks we've covered a heck of a ground today um, and sometimes complex areas and difficult challenges, obviously. Um, but your input has been very, very valuable in terms of helping us focus down into things that are really going to matter in terms of the, the report we will eventually produce as part of our budget considerations. I think we could have spent a fair lot long, longer time doing this, actually. I was quite surprised when I looked, when I looked up and saw that we'd actually come to our hour and a half to the end of it. So thank you for your invaluable contribution from all around the table. Um, I hope that you'll see eventually that some of the discussions we'll have will be reflected in the report. I thank you very much and I now close this meeting of the Finance Committee. <laughs>